During this tutorial, I'm going to teach you about how to assess and manage somebody with a goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid. By the end of this tutorial, you will understand how to take a proper history and what to look for in examination and the key tests you need to consider for someone presenting with a goiter. Then I'll take you through the salient points you need to understand when it comes to thyroid surgery. But first, let's have a quick recap on thyroid anatomy and function. The thyroid lies in the midline of the neck, deep to two of the strap muscles, sternohyoid and sternothyroid. It is symmetrical with what we call right and left lobes, and a small piece of thyroid tissue that joins them in the midline called the isthmus. The blood supply comes from the superior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the external carotid artery, and the inferior thyroid artery, which is a branch from the thyrocervical trunk. The venous drainage occurs via the superior, middle and inferior thyroid veins. The superior and middle thyroid veins drain into the internal jugular veins. The inferior thyroid veins drain into the brachiocephalic veins. Lymphatic drainage passes to the lateral deep cervical lymph nodes and the pre- and paratracheal lymph nodes. When it comes to thyroid hormone production, the hypothalamus in the brain produces thyrotropin-releasing hormone which stimulates the pituitary to release thyroid-stimulating hormone. This TSH acts on receptors in the thyroid gland causing release of more T3 and T4, the thyroid hormones. As these levels increase, they negatively feed back to the pituitary and TSH drops. Conversely, if the T3 and T4 levels drop, then the TSH would increase. Behind the thyroid glands, in somewhat variable positions, are four small parathyroid glands. These secrete parathyroid hormone which acts to raise the serum calcium level. This is important as these parathyroid glands can be disturbed during thyroid surgery as we will come to later. Great! Now imagine a patient has just walked into your clinic and you've immediately noticed a goiter. Wow, you're a detective. But what could this goiter represent? The term goiter refers to an enlarged thyroid gland that is easily visible or palpable in the neck in the neutral position. It is more prevalent in women and the female to male ratio is 4 to 1. The way you classify your patient's goiter in your mind is as follows. Goiters can be benign or malignant, hypothyroid, non-toxic, euthyroid, or toxic, hyperthyroid, and either solitary nodular, multinodular, or diffuse. Benign, diffuse, non-toxic goiters are usually physiological and can be caused by either pregnancy or puberty. The biggest worldwide cause, however, is iodine deficiency. Benign, non-toxic, multinodular goiters can sporadically occur and can arise from long-standing diffuse goiters. And benign, non-toxic, solitary nodular goiters usually turn out to be multinodular on ultrasound. Benign hypothyroid goiters include Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune thyroiditis, where autoantibodies against the thyroid gland cause fibrosis. When it comes to benign toxic goiters, we're now talking about things like Graves' disease, which is a result of antibodies directed against the thyroid stimulating hormone receptors, which activate them. Toxic multinodular goiters are often derived from a non-toxic goiter that becomes toxic and toxic solitary nodular goiters result from a single hyperplastic nodule secreting hormone autonomously. There are several types of malignant goiter but suffice to say the malignancy would be an indication for a thyroidectomy. Now the patient you noticed to have a goiter needs properly assessing. Let's start by taking a history. Generally, goiters are asymptomatic, although patients are often concerned about their poor aesthetic appearance. Now, when taking a history, ask about the growth of the goiter. How fast is it growing, for example? Next, ask about local symptoms. Just think about the surrounding anatomy. So it's important to ask symptoms like, do they have dysphagia, stridal, dyspnea, and vo vocal changes? Third, ask about the thyroid status. Are they feeling too hot or too cold? Are they having palpitations? 
Do they have any bowel changes, constipation versus diarrhea? Lastly, ask about thyroid disease in the family. Ah, Johnny's back. Now, Johnny's got quite a significant past medical history, growing at a rather alarming rate. Well, anyway, examining Johnny's thyroid, I start by looking for general features of altered thyroid status. So if our patient was hyperthyroid, he may appear thin, sweaty, tremulous, a tachycardia may be present, perhaps even a proptosis or exophthalmos. If our patient was hypothyroid, then actually he or she may have coarse, dry skin, mental slowness and a bradycardia. Once you've assessed the patient's thyroid status and determined whether he or she is hypothyroid, euthyroid or hyperthyroid, examine the goiter. This is the same as when you examine any lump. So assess the size, shape, symmetry, consistency and mobility. Now at this point you may only suspect the neck lump is coming from the thyroid. The feature that may clinch it is that it moves superiorly with swallowing. It should also not move with tongue protrusion, which is a feature of a thyroglossal cyst. Percuss the sternum in your exams to show that you are assessing the goiter for any retrosternal extension. Finally, always check for cervical and supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. When it comes to assessing a goiter, think bloods, imaging and cytology, or its function, where it is and what it is. When it comes to bloods, check the thyroid function tests. This may confirm a euthyroid patient. An ultrasound scan of the neck is a useful first-line imaging modality to assess the goiter and to pick up any lymph nodes. A CT or MRI chest and neck can assess any intrathoracic extension of the thyroid and also see what effect it may be having on nearby structures. Radionuclide scanning can tell you whether a nodule is hot or cold, or in other words, whether or not it is actively secreting thyroxine. Now with cytology, this means a fine needle aspiration and may be performed with ultrasound guidance. The cells can be analysed to try to give a diagnosis and guide management. Each cytology sample is given a score of Thy1 to Thy5. Thy1 on one end of the scale, meaning benign, and on the other end of the scale, Thy5, meaning malignant. Thy3 samples are uncertain and the lump may or may not be malignant. When it comes to prevention, addition of iodine to the diet has prevented endemic goiter. Patients with hypothyroid goiters are put on thyroxine replacement therapy. In those with toxic goiters, propanolol and carbimazole can be used. Propanolol is a beta blocker and may control some of the symptoms. And carbimazole interferes with thyroxine production and reduces its levels. In toxic goiters, radioactive iodine may also be used to reduce the thyroid toxicity and addition to reducing the size. Patients who are not candidates for radioactive iodine therapy include those with thyroid eye disease, pregnant women or women likely to be pregnant in the near future, or patients who are the main carers of young children. Thyroid surgery is indicated in those with malignancy or suspicion of malignancy, compressive symptoms, thyroid toxicity refractory to medical therapy, or anxiety and depression associated with poor cosmesis. Partial thyroidectomy can be considered in those with an asymmetric goiter with an enlarged side causing obstruction, or in patients with a possible malignancy where fine needle aspiration was unable to exclude it. If the specimen confirms malignancy, then a completion thyroidectomy can subsequently be performed. After a total thyroidectomy, there are some complications all junior doctors need to be aware of and able to diagnose on the ward. Immediately after surgery, rarely a post-operative bleed can occur. This can develop into a hematoma, obstructing the upper airway, and can be lethal to a patient. Any post-thyroidectomy patient with a swelling in the neck and difficulty breathing needs to be urgently decompressed. Recurrent laryngeal nerve damage is also an important post-operative complication. Unilateral vocal cord paralysis manifests as hoarseness or breathlessness and may not manifest for days to weeks. The patient may also have an increased risk of aspirating. Bilateral vocal cord paralysis usually manifests immediately after extubation. Patients may present with a biphasic stridor and respiratory distress. Urgent reintubation is required, and if this fails, an immediate emergency tracheostomy.
Another potential vulnerable nerve is the external laryngeal nerve, which can leave the patient with an altered tone of voice and an inability to create high pitch sound. Hypoparathyroidism can result from direct trauma to the parathyroid glands, devascularization of the glands, or removal of the glands during surgery. Postoperative hypoparathyroidism and the resulting hypocalcemia may be permanent or transient. The hypocalcemia is usually asymptomatic, but otherwise may manifest as paresthesia around the mouth or at the extremities, tetany, progressing onto ECG abnormalities and life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. Hypothyroidism is an expected consequence of total thyroidectomy. Measurements of the TSH levels is the most useful test to see if the patient is receiving the right dose of thyroxine therapy, which of course is lifelong. In this tutorial, I've gone through the salient features of assessment and management of a goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid gland. Goiters can be benign or malignant, toxic or non-toxic, and solitary, multinodular or diffuse. Examples of benign non-toxic goiter include Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and benign toxic goiters include Graves' disease, toxic multinodular goiter, and functional adenoma. When you take a history, you want to know the patient's thyroid status, if there are any local symptoms, and whether or not there is a family history. Examining the patient again establish the patient's thyroid status, and then evaluate the lump making sure to note whether it is indeed arising from the thyroid. Don't forget to check the lymph nodes. Investigations are bloods, imaging and cytology. Management may be thyroxine replacement in cases of hypothyroidism and propanolol and carbimazole for thyrotoxic cases. Radioactive iodine may also be used in some cases. If medical therapy hasn't worked, or the patient has a malignant goiter or compressive symptoms, then a total thyroidectomy is indicated. If you find yourself looking after a post-thyroidectomy patient, watch out for obstructing hematomas, vocal cord paralysis, voice changes, signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia, and the potential for patients who have undergone total thyroidectomy to be either over or under replaced with thyroxine. Well done! That was the box medicine tutorial on goiter. Now have a go at some of the multiple choice questions to test your knowledge at boxmedicine.com. See ya!